Live from New York at the Chainalysis Links Conference, this is Public Key, and I'm your host, Ian Andrews. This is the first episode of a series that will air over the next month, and the series is brought to you by our friends at Deloitte, the official sponsor of Live from Links. You could call 2021 the year of awakening for NFTs. When Beeple sold his collage every day for 69 million in March of that year, suddenly everyone was talking about non-fungible tokens. Now, 2022 saw a decline in NFT transaction volumes and floor prices as the overall market cooled down, but I'm more interested to explore what's next. So on this episode, I'm joined by NFT visionary and chief business officer from OpenSea, Shiva Rajaraman. OpenSea is the world's first and largest Web3 marketplace for NFTs and crypto collectibles. Shiva is very much focused on the future as well. And so on the episode, he shares how OpenSea is building to onboard the next million NFT collectors, all while making the process safer and easier to use. We talk consumer protection, creator royalties, and how the future of NFTs is going to be all about utility. Now the conference just wrapped as I'm recording this, and I wanted to thank all the attendees, the Chainalysis team, our partners for making it the biggest links in conference history. What made it memorable for me was the unique combination of public sector and private sector audience that the event attracts. It's a true cross section of the crypto industry. So if you missed out, and particularly if you're in Europe, you should know that registration for Lynx Europe is happening in Amsterdam on May 9th and 10th. Registration open now. The link can be found in the show notes. Hey everyone, we're recording live from Lynx. First guest here today is from OpenSea, Shiva Raga Raman. Did I get that right? Raja Raman? Close Raja enough. Raman. Yeah, yeah. All right. Like Roger Rabbit. You'll get that right. <laughs> yeah. Chief Business Officer at OpenSea. What's the most exciting thing happening at NFTs right now? Right now, I would say is, okay, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. Right? You looked at NFTs, you saw a lot of really interesting artistic projects emerge. Yeah. You saw effectively PFPs emerge, yep. right? Which really got into the intersection of art yep. and self-expression, right? Now where we're going is a lot more innovation on the utility front, right? And some of that's on-chain, some of it's off-chain, right? You've got a lot of really cool projects where the community around it is collaborating and riffing on things. That's the interop we always wanted to see in the space. But we're about to go into a world where I think the NFT is gonna have a lot of baked in utility. And we're really excited about that. So for example, an NFT that can be redeemed for something else. An NFT that's a character in a game that has value in other games. Right? And so now what we're seeing is a lot of investment going into the space to build out that ecosystem and prove or disprove. Some of these things are gonna be outright failures, right? But for every three failures, they're gonna have a magical success. We don't know what that's gonna look like, but I think we're about to enter the era of new use cases, which is really fun. Yeah, I had the head of strategy from Bang & Olufsen, yeah. the audio visual company. Oh, yeah, we yeah, actually cool. just published that podcast today. Nice. So uh, he joined us and they've done something really mm -hmm. interesting where you know, one of their iconic speakers, hmm. they've made a special version yeah. that unlocks when you buy one of the NFTs oh. of this recently created okay. collection that they launched with a number of digital artists yeah. and musicians. I mean, it's just an amazing yeah, connection yeah. of kind of virtual to real world. And it has this utility unlock where you have to have yeah, the NFT yeah. in order to buy this special edition speaker. I think that's lovely, right? Yeah. You're taking something that's kind of like ubiquitous for everyone and uniform for everyone, yeah. right? And now you've got this like magical unlock or surface area but if you own something digi digital, you can make that thing happen, right? Yeah. And I think uh, it's a great example. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So how, how did you get to OpenSea? I was, I was yeah. kind of stalking you a little bit on LinkedIn, yeah, yeah. as I like to do with my guests. And you've had a fascinating career, worked at all the tech giants, I think. Uh, Almost, yeah. Very, yeah. very lucky. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. Opening real is like Silicon Valley, but you know, yeah, some yeah. good, some bad, but yeah. generally good. Yeah. yeah. T take us through your story. How did you end up in this position at OpenSea? Yeah. Let me start with like the thread that pulls together a lot of my experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that uh, I love situations where you've got underserved people and then you have underserved creators. You're removing the gatekeepers. And then what ends up happening is all of these people start to see, wow, there's people creating content for me who look like me, right? And before, they never got greenlit, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, a platform emerges that allows them to basically find their 15 minutes of fame and hopefully sustain that, both in terms of distribution and economics. So I look at YouTube, I look at Spotify. This is a big part of the missions there. And so fast forward a little bit in time, all of a sudden, you get to Web3 emerges. 
Okay, there is no like singular platform gatekeeping. Everyone's effectively publishing their content. It's on chain. We, OpenSea and others, are explorers of that chain. And hopefully we can make it easier to access it. But I was like, this is pretty cool. Not only can someone control their art, they've got unliberated, basically liberated access to publish, but they can also invent their own business model. So I started, oh, this is really interesting. So I got pretty fascinated in it, started playing in the space. You know, um, you, know you start playing in the space for six months, you feel like you're a veteran already. <laughs> uh, there are many, many more people more experienced than me, both technically and on the artistic side. But I got excited about, ooh, what is it about my skills that can apply here? Yeah. And that's about discovery, that's about making sure that you can trust who you're interacting with, and then bringing some of those business models to life in a way that exist as primitives in our platform that make it easier for people to do things, yeah. that we think is important. You know, uh, you've seen the the rise yeah. and now the the yeah. rockiness, I guess, over yeah, the yeah. last year is a fair way to put it. I mean, OpenSea is the undisputed kind of leader, I think category creator maybe would be a fair way to describe the, the NFT marketplace. As you look out to the future, like what do you mm -hmm. see, where, where does that business go? Because there's been lots yeah. of clones that have kind of come online. For sure, yeah. And basically tried to take what made you all successful. But I have to imagine you're you're thinking two, three years out into the future about what you're enabling. Yeah, talk about that for sure. Bit. Let me talk through that. Like one, I want to put the horizon as six months to a year out. Right? That, in this that's space, fair. Right? Crypto, you know, yeah. you know, six months yeah, is exactly, actually exactly. Uh, but, five years in other spaces. But I would like these bets to last for two or three years. We yeah. think some of them do. But maybe one way to look at it is I do think what's happening in the environment right now is good. Competition effectively breeds right. a lot of both constraints for people, but also creativity. So we're really excited, right? Like, so one piece of this is that you've got OpenSea, and OpenSea has kind of straddled many different use cases today. And like any early mover in a space, you can kind of get away with that. Yeah. But now it's becoming more opinionated, right? We think of this as like an opportunity where we've got OpenSea Pro and we've got OpenSea, right? We acquired a company called Gem before. Yep. Gem has now been building, doing a bunch of cool stuff. Stay tuned for some news there, but we're really excited about Gem emerging as a pro platform that aggregates across 100 plus marketplaces and creates very sophisticated tooling for that audience that they need. OpenSea can then focus on bringing the next million into the space. So let me unpack that a little bit, okay? Yeah. So what is yeah. it bringing in the next million? So again, go back to what we started at. Everything's on the blockchain. Everything lives on the blockchain. So we're a layer on top of that blockchain that can be a reference app for cool use cases. So for example, if there's a cool NFT that has a different state, we can visualize that and make that very clear to people. We can be opinionated about that. Okay, you want it to look like this, you want a button next to it to take an action, we can render that button. It's hard to do on the blockchain, right? Yeah, it's not absolutely. a UI layer. So yeah. one is be a friendly face. The second piece of it is onboarding people on. You'll see us make a lot of investments on fiat payments, much easier to use wallet, right? That's mm -hmm. tightly integrated so that we can effectively onboard people easily. Is that your own wallet you're creating? Or you're uh, we'll work around partners and stuff like okay. that. And so, yep. But I think one of the key things for us is like, we can't let the fact that multiple companies are involved translate to a Frankensteinish experience, yeah. right? Yeah. We're gonna put a nice code on top of that thing and make it easy to use. Yeah. Now, it's also very important as we do that, we educate people too. So we have a bunch of investments in learned content. As we put someone through the flow, we, want, we don't want them to think that they're, they're just on a commerce site either. Yeah. There are important things to understand. Hey, I'm buying something, I actually own it. I can transfer it. I can transfer it outside of OpenSea. I can use it in different games. Yeah. So we don't want to obfuscate the underlying mechanics here. Yeah. We don't want to make it like 12 different, you know, articles you need to read to figure out how to do something, right? Which for a lot of people is really frustrating. Yeah. And then finally we create a safety blanket over this, right? Like any open system, there's spam, there's all kinds of stuff that happens here. So we've yeah. done a lot of investments on that side. And while you still have to be watch out for things that can go wrong, we're trying to be more of a guide as you go through that and protect you from the most egregious things too. Apologies. I'm going to interrupt here mid-podcast. Shiva actually made a great point during the Lynx conference in his main stage panel about preventative measures to detect illicit activity using chainalysis. Let's listen in quickly. 
So the things we do, like any open system, is that we need to protect against what can happen in an open system, which is if spam happens, like do we filter it out? Those are things we're working on. Can we work with the wallet ecosystem so that we can give you more plain speak warnings about things that might be you know, potentially precipitous if you're not careful? And what are the other types of things we can do so that we can start to detect transactions and see if they look peculiar to us, then we can start to freeze those transactions until people release them. So we've been doing a lot of this in the world of like particularly around theft, but also just understanding who's real and who's not with verification and trying to be like that type of blanket on top of the space. So when it comes to chain analysis, part of this is how do we get that signal that we can use to be better at these things? And can that signal be trained across the entire blockchain ecosystem independent of OpenSea so we can use it productively? That's where we focus on working with partners like that. Perfectly said. Now let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. protection point is what yeah. I'd love to pull on sure. that thread a little bit because, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. You see every couple of yeah. weeks a user, oh, you know, I fell victim to a phishing scam or mm -hmm. I, you know, somebody uh, hacked my wallet, I lost my prized NFT. Yeah. It's not directly an open C issue. It's not like you guys had a security vulnerability. Like these are like wallet misconfigurations or someone guessed a passphrase or they gave up their passphrase they shouldn't have right. or they interacted with a bad contract. But do you all feel like a sense of responsibility around that consumer protection issue? Like, and is there a solve that can be originated from OpenSea? For yeah, this? so there's a lot of things we can do, but let me start with first is that whether there's responsibility or not, if we want the next million people to come into the space, it can't be this world that it is today, yeah. right? Yeah. So we have to put the guardrails in, we have to give people, there's kind of like, the path into this space, which is like jumping off a cliff with a parachute <laughs> and loving it, or the one that's like a nice gradual ramp, yeah, right? We have to yeah. provide effectively. There's not too many base yeah, jumpers yeah, in the yeah, world. Yeah, you know, yeah, the, you can the, get the debauch few, and but... the Disney, right? Yeah. We have to work together. And we have to be okay with that. Yeah. That doesn't mean that someone can go off path once they get sophisticated yeah. and have the independence that they relish, right? Yeah. And many people start there. But for a lot of people, hey, I really love that creator. I want to own their art. I want to self-express myself with that art. I want to play that game. But the esoteric nature of how to get there, that puzzle that you need to solve, that's not interesting for me, right? I want to skip over that part. Yeah. So our job has to be to make that easier ramp for people who want that lightweight experience to get straight to the utility or the experience, right? Yeah. And we're going to invest a lot there. But for example, it's an open system. Every open system, it includes email, SMS, as we've seen, just gets overridden by spam. Yeah. So some of the basics that we've done, like auto hill hiding airdrops from irreputable things, is just something that's good for people. I don't yeah. want my profile filled with stuff because that becomes a vector. But more importantly, it's like, hey, that's my profile. If I'm using it to say what I own and love, then it can't be littered with stuff that I didn't like. So right. auto hiding that makes sense, yeah. right? Similarly, detecting bad URLs. Obviously, there's some basic patterns you can look for here. So who else is gonna do it? We feel obligation to do that type yeah. of thing, right? Again, it falls into this being a nice, safe on-ramp to the space. And then there's other things we're doing which are broader with the ecosystem. Okay, so some of that is working with the wallet providers, yeah. and you'll see us do more stuff there so that between us and other wallet providers, when you're signing things or giving you warnings or protections, maybe you're an expert in reading the, you know, what can often look like gibberish to many people. But for a lot of people, why don't I have a plain speak language or warning there? It goes a long way. Yeah. So we're going to invest on that stack and keep making progress there. That's great. I think wallet UX is, is such a hard yeah. thing to get right, it seems like, right yeah, now yeah. In, in crypto. Even simple things yeah. like, by default, NFTs don't show up in your MetaMask. You have to go and add the, the contract. Like that simple addition, I think, makes it so much simpler. I, I see so many messages from people who are like, hey, I bought the NFT, but now I don't see the NFT in my MetaMask. What happened? Did it get right, transferred right. to the wrong place? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Imagine Starbucks customer service taking that call, right? Exactly. You know, so these are the things that get in the way of maybe some of the top brands moving in the space. Yeah. But I do think you need an area which is, and I think you know this from your developer background too, which is just that there are people who want to be able to hack the system and do what they want. They want people who want to go straight to the signal yeah. and maybe don't want this, you know, what they perceive as fluff around it. Yeah. That's all good. Yeah. And one thing about Web3 is that you don't ever, you give people all the options, right? right? 
Now, the problem right now, if there's only one option that fits one type of user, right, then you run into a situation where mistakes can happen all yeah. the time. Yeah, you don't want a sealed black box, yes. but you do need that happy path That's right, yeah. for, for the vast majority of users. Going back to something you mentioned a couple minutes ago, the GEM uh, acquisition. Yeah. So they were known as, a, as an aggregator, mm -hmm. meaning as a collector or an investor, I could execute a transaction across multiple yep. marketplaces at once. Yes. So if I was trying to corner a particular NFT collection, mm -hmm. I could go buy them all without driving up my prices, I think was kind of their their key feature yeah, just, and innovation, right? Yeah, create a, an envelope across multiple marketplaces, yep. right? So that you are a single point, yeah. if you will, for yep. someone who's buying or selling anything. When you think about the pro user, so you talked yep. about how you're taking some of that core technology yep. that Gem developed and you're extending it for this audience. Is that is that an investor? Is it a collector? Is it a collection developer? Is it all of the above? I'd like, call who, it, you know, an active buyer. So like someone who's like, look, when I wake up every morning, I think NFTs, yeah, right? And yeah. I'm looking at prices for different collections. Yeah. I might have a large holding. Yeah. I'm aspiring to have a large holding. But these are people who probably, right, are buying and selling every day. They have very strong opinions on when they should buy, when they should sell. They want to look at trends, right, related to price points. They want to be able to do things that might be a little bit more advanced for the typical user. So a good example, we, we launched this on OpenSea, but it'll be a big part of OpenSea Pro, but, you know, trade-based offers, okay. right? So you can have normal collection offers where you're coming in at a floor price, give me five, awesome. Yep. But doing that at the trade level, is another layer of sophistication, yeah. and these are the types of advanced orders that these users want. You can do some of that on OpenSea. We've been successful at collection and trade offers on OpenSea, but gradually you get to, oh, multiple marketplaces, a lot of activity, things are lighting up every day about actions you can take. Yeah. That starts to fork from what a mainstream user is looking for. Yeah. It can be very overwhelming. So the idea of taking those two audiences and giving them a more opinionated product is, is very important. One of the things I'm curious about when I first started getting excited about NFTs was the shift in royalty model. Sure. The old joke about every artist dies a starving artist, uh, yeah. you know, and after his death, suddenly the art's worth something. That always kind of stuck with me. And I was like, oh, in, you know, this model of an artist being able to enjoy the benefit of profits yes. reaped by collectors to some degree. It seems like there's been a lot of controversy around mm -hmm. this royalty model and NFTs and are the contracts enforceable yeah. or not. I haven't totally followed all the details. I'm curious yeah. where where do you stand on this? It seems like OpenSea is very creator friendly, so I imagine you fall that way. But to a large extent, I mean, we definitely are very creator friendly. But yeah. let me talk about this yeah, space it'd be great and try to, to like it. lay it out. We did make some changes recently, and okay. I want to make sure that's clear. First and foremost is that as we look forward in time for effectively new contracts that are coming into the system going back to the beginning of the year. They can use effectively an on-chain royalty specification. So if this chain, that royalty enforcement is specified on-chain, we enforce it as well. And we expect all the other marketplaces now to enforce it. Let's go back in time to these legacy collections, right? Which is that they aren't upgradable. They can't specify this on-chain. They can't mutate that contract to effectively comply with this new model. So our original approach was to say, hey, we're also enforce royalties there, and our expectation was hopefully other marketplaces would follow, right? That didn't happen. What ended up happening is all the volume on those collections, particularly the head of those collections, moved to other marketplaces. Now, that puts creators in an awkward situation. Do I want the volume and liquidity on a different marketplace, or do I want the royalties preserved on OpenSea, yep. but it'll be a small amount of yep. transactions? In a perfect world, those other marketplaces would have said, we also would respect the legacy royalty preservation. But ultimately, the market decided, we decided to also just comply with what everyone's doing. We're committed to royalties moving forward. Any new collection, you'll see most collections dropping on OpenSea now, have royalties specified on chain. Yep. And eventually, I think the new will eclipse the old. But obviously, for these legacy collections, you know, we want to figure out you know, ways to make sure that if creators are rewarding their community for paying those royalties, that we surface them on our platform as well and let them know about those opportunities. So that's where we're looking at this. But the enforcement side, from February onward, everything's cool. Awesome. You mentioned very creator friendly. Yeah. I think there's also a lot of collaboration going on with brands, right? Yes, it yes. Seems, it seems like you mentioned Starbucks earlier yeah. and we were talking about Bang & Olufsen a little bit. There's really big companies, yeah. widely known, jumping into this space. For sure. 
what does OpenSea do to help them figure this stuff out? Because I would imagine, you yeah. know, an, an organization like either of those two, it's a pretty complex new territory for them. Yeah, yeah. So one, what, what I'll step back and say is that there's a nice ecosystem emerging, including OpenSea and others, who are helping brands figure this out. It might be good to step back and ask, like, what is the brand's goal here? You have a few different goals that are happening. One is that I'm a brand and I have like a spectrum of fans for my brand. And so there's a group of these folks who might be like really my most avid fans at the end of the day, right? Really passionate. Not only, you know, they're the people who don't just buy Coke, right? They wear the, sh the clothes, right? <laughs> and, they go to everything. and for every brand that group exists. So one thing they want to do in the Web3 world is what can I do to give that fan base even more empowerment or even more ownership or more access or just accolades? And is there a way to create projects that effectively, you know, perfectly couple their intent as a fan, right, with increased value? And potentially at times there's a price associated with that too, yeah. which makes giving that in disproportionate value affordable for the brand and profitable for the brand. So you're seeing that ecosystem kind of arise and there's a bunch of people helping out. Now I still think we're in the early days. So what we've done is we stepped back and said, okay, we launched basically moved from a secondary market to a primary market. We launched our ability to drop projects on OpenSea. And as part of that, we work with these brands very closely and that includes top Web3 projects as well. Frankly, any project for that matter, right? Come in and try different things. We give you a canvas that's very rich. So it's got sight sound in motion, right? It's videos play, you basically create the page you want, you can put modules on there. But you're effectively building something that looks like a website for you, but within the safe confines of OpenSea, you know, we'll take care of fiat payments and all kinds of stuff that might be difficult for you. Yeah. And we make that available for people. Yeah. And then, we spend time with those brands. Well, market's very different now. Here's what pricing we're seeing out there. Yeah. Here's like ideas about collection size. Don't have 15 allow lists, right? Like things like that. You know, think about like mechanisms. But what we hope is we learn what's working in the network. There'll still be pioneers out there, but we can share these best practices with brands as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that's such an advantage if you're coming new into the space. Like, I can't imagine launching a serious collection without collaborating. That's right. We, d we definitely want people to succeed, not because they messed up at execution and didn't understand it. Yeah. It's they succeed or fail based on a good idea. Yeah. So whether you're a brand or a small creator, that still applies. And that's why we've opened up this platform to any creator as well. Yeah. So like I said before, no gatekeepers, right? Like we need to have like people try different things. Yeah. The greatest ideas are going to come from unusual places or unexpected places. I think you were previously at Meta. A year ago, we were all talking about how we were going to be living in the metaverse <laughs> shortly. It seems like even Meta has now retrenched a little bit. Uh, I don't know if there's another name change coming. Uh, <laughs> re reversion back to, Nothing to I Facebook. Know about. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm curious, like, do you see the metaverse concept still progressing forward outside of what Meta's doing? I feel like the NFTs are kind of the gateway yeah. to the metaverse in a lot of ways, or is that has that fallen off in favor of gaming and more artistic pursuits? I, so I've always looked at this as more of a spectrum. One of the first things that Web3 and NFTs represent, just to start with, is like, I own this thing, and it's very clear that I own it, and that can be uniquely owned by me. The second thing is it's portable across many different environments. And those two things become pretty magical. There's no lock-in, it's completely visible. That means people can create experiences for this object you own without having a BD discussion with anyone else, right? Yeah, like, yeah. it's really interesting things that can happen. So if you believe in this transparency and openness, then what we get out of it is people can create worlds or experiences around it. I think that's really the magical thing that's going on. Now you can take that and you can layer on experiences on top of it. One of which could be putting on our goggles and going to the metaverse in VR. I don't personally think the technology is perfectly there, nor are, is there enough games or experiences there. But probably that will happen, yep. right? And the question is like, what form does it take? I'm not sure what form it will take, but I doubt it's one company's vision. I think it's ultimately going to be like a kaleidoscope of things that happen. And one of them is going to stick, and one of them is going to be an awesome game, and one of them is going to be a world that maybe has social aspects, and maybe one of them is like just a great place to learn. We are, you know, beings that exist in 3D, and we have multiple senses. And if we can learn in that environment, that's pretty exciting. Does that mean I want to be in a classroom all day, right? You know? So like the things that I've had trouble with are like, well, I actually don't want to be in a corporate conference room 
in the metaverse and put my goggles on and have a meeting there. Zoom's great. I love the fact that I can turn off the video. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so why are we degrading that? I don't yeah. actually want to be in the room for yeah. most places with that purpose. Yeah. But for an immersive game, that makes a lot of sense. Okay? Yeah. So if we can really step back, I think there's a lot of things that are going to happen here. But once you have that digital ownership and I can transfer it to you and share it with you and you can build something that I can go play with based on what I own, that will exist in very, very traditional environments as well as potentially a metaverse. But I think there's so much innovation that can happen in AR, our existing kind of Web 2-like applications, existing games, betting on this thing and coupling it tightly with that. Well, maybe this thing will happen, but it's probably not happening right now. I totally agree with you, and I yeah. love it. That was a, a great place, I think, to wrap up our discussion. I'll of course, let you yeah. get back to the conference. Thanks so Thank much you for much. joining us. Appreciate it. Take yeah. care. See ya. Hey there. Thanks for listening to a special Live from Links episode of Public Key. This is the first episode of a series that will air over the next month. The series is brought to you by our good friends at Deloitte, the official sponsor of Live from Links. Last week, Chainalysis was proud to announce multiple partnerships. First, the Calgary Police Service and Chainalysis are launching the Western Canada Cryptocurrency Investigation Center. It's an innovative regional center that will train and enable law enforcement to more effectively address modern digital crimes that involve cryptocurrency. And second, Chainalysis entered into a strategic partnership with Halborn, one of the foremost experts on preventative security and smart contract auditing to offer best-in-class protocol safety to help equip Web3 companies at any stage stage to prevent and respond to security threats that have plagued the industry. And if you'd like to learn more about Halborn, just rewind back a few episodes in your favorite podcast platform and you'll find me talking to their COO, David Schwed. For more details on both partnerships, you can also find links in the show notes.